Uh, well, I want to thank Sissy for inviting me to be here and the whole uh, women's team here at IBC. Uh, today we get to talk about corruption. And I know it's just something we all can't wait to talk about. It's so fun to talk about how we live in this fallen world with all of these injustices and pain and death and sickness. But before we get there, I want to remind you of something that Alice had shared in the introduction week. And she said that we get to engage in worship of our God as our creator king who made us in his image, who gave us incredible dignity and purpose, who delights in us and draws near to us, who lives in us and among us, who loves us beyond measure, the one who is for us and not against us, that the only one worthy of all praise and glory invites us to live in that reality every day. And that is what it is to experience the kingdom-shaped life. And then last week, we looked at the origin story that we see outlined in the beginning of Genesis. And Camille left us with really powerful homework to put your hands in dirt, to ask God for a restored kingdom vision for yourself and for the land that we are in. And it is no news to any of us that the land that we are in is corrupted and corruptible. We know that we live in a fallen world. And I laughed when I was listening to the recording of Camille's teaching because she mentioned Magic Kingdom and Disney. And my family actually earlier this month went to Magic Kingdom. This was our first time. This is one of the family photos where we're all actually smiling, where no one's looking the wrong direction or like wanting to be done with all of the photos that mom wants to have taken. And we had a phenomenal trip. It was a great family vacation. But can I tell you that there is nothing like visiting a hot, humid, consumer-driven theme park with fatigued families that are all standing in the longest lines we can ever imagine, hopefully for the shortest amount of time possible, to remind us that we live in a fallen world. We are in a corrupt kingdom even when we're in magic kingdom. Like, this world is tough. But at the same time, it kept reminding me of Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, that we have this juxtaposition of two things that are true. And my kids have this recollection of this trip. And going into it, uh, I started telling them things. I actually dreamt about someday taking my children to Disney World since before I was even married, since before I had children. I was dreaming about what this trip could look like for them. And then for any of you who have planned family vacations or big trips with friends, you know there's a lot of detailed work that goes into planning outings like this. And so I started giving my kids hints about what these experiences were going to be like, and they had absolutely no concept of how good it was going to be. My six-year-old, at one point, he said, do you think they'll have cotton candy? Like the real kind, not that comes in a tub, but that comes on a wand. And I was like, yep, buddy, they're going to have cotton candy. A couple days before we left, I told him, okay, guys, are you ready for the secret for today that you're going to learn about Disney World? And he said, yeah. And I said, guess what? There's fireworks. What? No way. There's going to be fireworks. They had no concept for how amazing and fun it was going to be. And that pales in comparison to the good news that we have of our unimaginable, ununderstandable God and how he works for our good. He is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power at work in us. And so the good news about corruption is that human sin did not break God's story. The Flourish book on page 25, it says, the Bible tells one epic and true story about God, humanity, and the world. It's the story that makes sense of all our smaller stories over all of time and in all places. And so my first point for us today is that God is incorruptible. We do live in a fallen world, but that does not mean that God has become corrupted. In 1 Timothy 1.17, it says, Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, 
the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. And that word immortal there is afthartos. In the original language, it means uncorrupted, not liable to corruption or decay, imperishable, undecaying and immortal. That is who our God is, not liable to corruption or decay. In 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21, it says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believed in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. It was not with perishable things that we were purchased. And part of our origin story, which we looked at last week, is that before the creation of the world, Jesus was chosen for our rescue. We were born, we were created, humanity was birthed already beloved. Jesus was already our rescuer. And so point number two is that God's kingdom is not corrupted. See, as humans, we face competing realities, and we are all very aware of the stories that are vying for our attention. We have our original reality, the love story of how God created us and who we are as his image bearers, that we are created in love, by love, and already beloved. Our original reality, our greatest reality is God's kingdom. But we also have a lesser reality, that we live in a fallen, corrupted, physical world. And we're confronted with this reality all the time, in our own sinful nature, in systemic injustices, in pain, in death, in illness. We live in a fallen world. The world around us is full of corruption. And this lesser story competes for our attention and devotion. It competes with our appetites. It competes with the things that we are pained by. It competes to draw us in, to have us ignore the greater reality of God's incorruptible kingdom, to think that this is all that there is, to think that all hope is lost, that all is corrupted, that this is as good as it possibly can get. But God is not in that competition. He has already won, and we get to live from the true story. And so we as humans, we're navigating this life with an awareness of both. I have a lesser reality that I am part of this fallen world. And I have a greater reality that Jesus has always been my rescue, that I can be part of God's kingdom. And so I'm going to read for us, not the whole chapter of 1 Peter chapter 1, but many different verses from it. And I'm actually going to break that in and carry over into a little bit of 1 chapter 1 Peter chapter 2, because 1 Peter is a letter that is written to exiles, and they are exiled because they have converted to their Christian faith. It's often referred to as a circular letter because it was intended to circulate among Christian communities. And these letters, if we think back to the original time when they were sent, they were sent with messengers. And so they were sent and they were read with local congregations. So they would come and read a letter. Sometimes they would even perform the letter. They would discuss it often in home church gatherings. And then the letter would be sent on to the next gathering of believers. And we're going to see Ophthartos a couple different times in my reading of 1 Peter 1. It's talking about an Ophthartos inheritance and being born again of Ophthartos seed. Incorruptible, immortal, undecaying. And so my invitation to you, I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation because I want it to feel a little bit different. My invitation to you is to consider what it would be like to be in exile, hearing this letter sent from a church leader. Because the reality is that even us here in this day and age, living in a corrupted world, we are exiles because this is not our home. 
We are those who get to live with kingdom perspective, and that changes how we engage in the world around us. So I'll start a little bit into verse one. I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, and the DFW Metroplex. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and his spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show you that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him, even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him, and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. For you have been born again but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes with the eternal living word of God. As the scriptures say, people are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that was preached to you. So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. Did you hear both realities? the fullness of life that we can have as members of God's incorruptible kingdom and how that requires that we refuse to live as we once did, that we are now exiles in this world. It doesn't deny the trials. It doesn't say, oh, we're just gonna have rose-colored glasses and pretend that everything's fine. No, you live in a corrupt place, but you are also part of an incorruptible kingdom while you are here. Our world was corrupted we're familiar with the fall, the false story that humanity believed about God, but it didn't corrupt his kingdom, even though the enemy would love for us to think that it did. Oh, if only. Have you ever felt those accusation questions come from the enemy? Oh, if only. Oh, if only Adam and Eve hadn't eaten that fruit, then we could know God. Oh, if only you had never sinned in that way. Oh, if only this part was not part of your past, then you could be a daughter of the king. The enemy cannot undo what God has set apart for us. And so there are three ways that we can think of corruption. The first one is back then, historical. Okay, well, there was corruption way back then. We read about that in Genesis. And my encouragement for us today is just skip the blame game. If it wasn't Adam and Eve, it would have been somebody else, at the very least someone named Jen. And it just would have, it would have been there. Like, okay, we have 
our own human frailties. We have our sin nature. We also have agency and choice and free will and God's already set aside plan for our redemption. And corruption is not just back then. It's still happening now. The other way we can think of corruption is out there, which is true. There are cycles and systems of sin and corruption. In our study, we looked at Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and the corruption of society in the time of Noah and those wanting to exalt their own name as they built the Tower of Babel. But it's not just then or them. The cycle of God's people continues throughout scripture, throughout human history, where we come to know God in some ways and we turn again away from him and he offers us consistent reconciliation that we can falter, but he doesn't. And so I'm actually gonna read for you an excerpt from a poem I have in a poetry collection called A Beckoning to Wonder. And this collection explores the grand story of the Bible and of God's care for us. And it's coming from the poem, What Continues? And it relates to this topic as we look at this cycle that we can walk through and how God remains constant. And so I'll read an excerpt here, and I encourage you to listen for that. God sought, shame covered Adam and Eve. In brokenness they hid, yet God came to find them. Removing their shame, he clothed them in care, promised rescue. God revealed himself to Cain and Abel, even outside the garden. Cain withheld worship, but called it good, stole breath from his brother when God didn't agree, wandered away afraid of the same sin-designed doom, yet God marked him protected, eliminated his fear. God promised barren Abraham and Sarah a nation of children. They didn't trust him, held it against him, splintered their family by a different story, yet God followed through on his word. God rescued the enslaved nation of Israel. Out of Egypt, they vowed to follow him. But Moses lingered on the mountain. People panicked, ruptured into chaos, worshiped an art project as the God who rescued them. Yet still, God's presence guided them. God cared for his hard-headed people as their sovereign king, led them in travel, went before them in battle, but other nations had human kings. Israel wanted to be like them. God warned them of their pending pain, and still they tore away. In all generations, God's people sin and return to God and return to sin again and again and again. We falter and fracture, yet God never does. God is incorruptible, and God's kingdom is not corrupted. But the corruption of our world isn't just back then or out there. It's also in here. It's me. I can participate in the corruption of the world around me. And yet, God is constant in his care. That's the good news about corruption. You guys have uh, half sheets of paper or cards on your table, and I invite you at this point to grab one if you haven't already. They're just blank cards. We're going to do a quick activity. And so I'm going to invite you to write down one time you took part in corruption. And no one else is going to see this. No one else. It can be a, a time of sin. It can be a time where you're like, oh man, I really missed the mark. It could be before you knew Jesus, before salvation. It could be 10 years ago. It could be yesterday. One time you took part in corruption. And then I want you to write down as much as you can think of in the time that we have allotted. It's going to be quick. Some of the yet God good news that you have now in hindsight Yet God brought restoration or rescue or redemption or healing. Yet God in how he cared for you. Yet God in his consistent nature. Yet God in his response when you called to him. Yet God in how you are different now from who you were then. I'm going to stop talking and give you about a minute to do this.
give you a couple more seconds to wrap up your thoughts. God is constant, even when we're not. He is incorruptible and not undone by corruption. And exercises like this can be so powerful because sometimes the corruption of our world can cloud our view. Even the corruption of my own heart, the ways that I participate in sin, my, my selfish nature, my lack of patience, those things can feel so big and looming and frustrating and heavy. Yet God is consistent in his care. Yet God does not turn us away when we repent. Yet God renews and transforms. He redeems. And we can look at the grand story of the Bible and see God on display in this way. And we can look at the grand story of who God is on display in our own lives and see him on display in this way too. If it was hard for you to think of any of those yet gods, I'd encourage you to continue this activity at home. Ask God more about it. Go back to the Bible and see what has not been thwarted by the corruption in our world. There's a lot. God's plans prevail. His purposes are not undone. And so we can live in this world according to our kingdom reality. That's our last main point here. We get to return back to the greater story, to the true story, to the true reality of who God is and what he's like and how he cares for us. And I think about it like a tape measure. I want to snap back more quickly. If you ever, ever had your finger pinched by a really active, happy tape measure, it's like, okay, we did what we're doing and we're going back. Everything's wrapping back into that container here. I want to be like that when my attention gets drawn away. When I start living as though I am still corrupted, I'm not one of those that God has redeemed. I want to snap back. Okay, God, bring me into right alignment. We've already looked at a lot of scriptures today about corruption, and God doesn't ignore sin. He pays for it. He redeems us from it. And we get to participate in our kingdom reality by partnering with him and what he's doing in us in doing in the world, by living more aware of God and his kingdom. And one of those ways we do that is with confession, confessing sins and confessing truth. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And in 1 Timothy 6.12, it says, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Confess what is sinful. Repent. Think again. Choose a different course. And confess what is true. Agree with. Profess it. Don't deny it, but declare it. Even in our lament and our mourning, we are confessing what is true, what is true about our world, what is true about the God we put our hope in. In our proclamations, in our worship, in our prayers, we are declaring what is true. We are confessing the one that we are relying on. And we also get to have compassion for ourselves and others. God is the father of compassion. We're looking back to our original reality, our kingdom identity as children of the father of compassion. In 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 through 4, it says, Praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. What we get to do is living as part of this kingdom-shaped life is to live a life of compassion and confession. We get to be those who extend the compassion that we have received from God to other people, but that requires that we first receive that compassion from God. Sometimes I have treated God like I'm just a conduit, a conveyor belt, to go and receive the compassion to give to somebody else. Like all of the compassion is coming along, but it's not really for me. It's only for them. And he says, hey, share the comfort that you yourselves have received from Christ. You are a daughter of the father of compassion. 
And so we can live as active participants in his incorruptible kingdom by receiving compassion from God, which, by the way, comes with confession too. And then we get to share that with other people. We too have lived according to the lesser story. We know what that's like. We too need God's rescue and long for the world to be set right. We too are exiles in a corrupt land that is not our home. And we get to participate here in God's glorious kingdom. God is not and will not ever be corrupted. And his kingdom knows no end. That, my friends, is the good news about corruption. Thanks for letting me spend this time with you.